I think you're okay to go. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Pam Kastner. I have the honor of serving as Patent State Lead for Literacy and also to spend this time with you as part of the accelerated learning series, um, designing a system of scaffold supports, universal core supports, explicit instruction. That's what we'll be spending our time on. So to engage you uh, in explicit instruction as well as share some information with you, um, I have created a Padlet that has the presentation, the videos that you will see, um, and some note-taking guides. Um, you'll be able to respond to these note-taking guides and to the videos that you see later in the presentation um, through the chat and through the Q&A. So um, Sarah is placing the uh, link to the Padlet into the chat right now. So I'm gonna give you um, about a minute to access that because it's gonna be really important for this presentation and then we'll start. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to access the Padlet. This will be a nice resource for the presentation itself, but um, also after the presentation for your review. So here are the key components that we'll be engaged in in this training. Um, we're gonna be sharing uh, briefly the research to support explicit instruction. We'll be defining it, um, talking about its underlying principles, some components that are essential uh, to explicit instruction, so the attributes, and um, we'll be engaged in some videos and taking some notes on those videos to interact in this presentation. And we'll also look at some instructional routines that are essential to explicit instruction. Okay, so certainly at um, PDE and BSE and Patent, we are always firmly grounded in um, the science, the research that supports um, our practices. One of the most uh, precious things we have is time when we're instructing students and certainly we want to be engaged in uh, instruction that is most effective and certainly as you can see on the screen this uh, plethora of research that has supported explicit instruction for many 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 years and also been repeated in syntheses and meta-analyses uh, so we want to make sure that you um, we shared this research with you in terms of the foundation of the research supporting explicit instruction um, we'll share a, an explicit um, research um, study with you in just a moment. So what is explicit instruction from ideas at work? Um, explicit instruction is systematic. Instructional approach includes design and des delivery procedures. And we'll be watching a video of a classroom instruction for explicit instruction. We'll, we'll tease out the design and the delivery of that instruction. Uh, one of the key ideas of explicit instruction is it's unambiguous. It's very direct. Um, and it incorporates um, these um, components. It's direct, it's explicit, it's systematic, and it's engaging the um, students that you are um, teaching. So there's a lot of, uh, as um, Dr. Archer would say, I say something, you say something, I write something, you write something. There's a high degree of engagement between the teacher and the students. Um, so what, what do we mean by direct? Um, that means that the teacher defines uh, and teaches the concepts, models them, uh, guides students through that learning process with lots of scaffolds and supports until they're no longer needed, and gives them extended guided practice before they are doing independent practice. There is clear, concise language with a direct expl explanation, um, and the procedures are modeled, and there's no vagueness or there's no ambiguity. Um, there's no discovery here. Um, it's direct and explicit. It is systematic. And by systematic, we mean that it moves from least complex to most complex in a, in a logical sequence uh, that the skills build on each other. Um, there are instructional routines that are very specific that engage students that allow them to master what they're learning. There's practice and introduction. Um, it encourages students to be more attentive. And certainly when students are attentive and engaged in instruction, we have less um, behavior management issues. So it's supportive there as well. Um, the slides that you're seeing now and the next couple are from the book Explicit Instruction by Anita Archer and Charles Hughes, which strongly encourage you, if you're interested in learning more about 
explicit instruction, that would be an ideal text to read. So um, if you've ever seen Anita Archer, um, when she talks about explicit instruction, and we'll see her um, shortly, it's all about this model of I do it, we do it, you do it. If you've heard about explicit instruction, you've likely heard these terms. Um, I do it means, of course, I'm sharing the learning intention or the goal of the learning, very specifically the learning objective to students. And then I model what that looks like. I, as a teacher, provide that model with my turn. So there's no ambiguity. It's very direct and explicit. The we do it is the guided practice where the teacher and the uh, students are engaged in uh, the learning objective together. This gives the teacher many opportunities formatively to see if students have mastered the concept before they're left to independent practice. It also offers opportunities for error correction, um, modeling the correct response and providing repeated practice um, to make ensure that the concept is learned. It also provides opportunities to provide affirmative feedback to students so they understand when they are moving towards that learning goal that's shared um, in the I do at the beginning of the lesson. Um, before students are released, um, this is a gradual release of responsibility model. Before students are released to practice independently, and the goal of that, of course, is to transfer and generalize that learning and to master that learning, um, they have lots of practice. Um, that's one thing um, you'll hear Dr. Archer talk about as well in the upcoming video, is the need for students to have lots of practice. Not only does it help students retain, transfer, and generalize what they're learning, but it offers ample opportunities for the teacher to provide the feedback that's necess necessary to ensure learning. So um, when you hear explicit instruction, um, these three um, statements really encapsulate explicit instruction. I do it, we do it, you do it. Okay. So I shared some research with you earlier in the uh, slide that's um, historical um, data as well. Uh, in 2017, Charles Hughes, who was one of the authors with Anita Archer of Explicit Instruction and other colleagues, uh, looked to the literature from 2000 to 2016 and did a literature review of explicit instruction, um, of rigorous research, to determine what were the essential components of explicit instruction, uh, what showed up in the literature over and over and over again. So the graphic that you see on the left, the five essential components of explicit instruction, um, showed up in the, in, uh, the research uh, from 2000 to 2016 in over 75% of the literature. So these are considered essential components for explicit instruction. So we're going a little bit deeper than, than the I do, we do, you do. And then um, seven um, essential components um, also showed up in the, the research. These components to the right were those that showed up from 50 to 74% of the time in literature. So we'll review the five essential components a little bit more deeply and um, the seven, a little less so. So we'll have time to um, engage in the video and some feedback from you. Okay, so from the research study that just mentioned, these are the five essential components of explicit instruction. So if you are uh, a principal, uh, a coach, a teacher, these are the things, these are the foundational components that you should have um, as part of your explicit instruction. Uh, that you're segmenting complex skills uh, to chunks. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. That you're modeling and providing think alouds. You are providing supports and scaffolds as the learning is taking place, but you are thinking about how you will fade those supports and prompts. You're providing opportunities for responding and receiving feedback, which we talked before. One of the key hallmarks of explicit instruction is many, many, many opportunities for students to respond and get feedback. And then when we're practicing, that the practice is purposeful. So let's look at these big five uh, components a little bit more closely. So what does it mean when we say segment complex skills? Um, likely, if you've um, heard this term before, you've heard about chunking up. Chunking up these complex skills is task analysis uh, from least complex to no most complex and chunking them up in a logical sequence. It reduces the cognitive load, the working memory load, and the cognitive complexity for students. So you're breaking down these complex tasks into these strategic, smaller, more manageable units of instruction. Most importantly too, uh, in this logical scope and sequence, you're requiring that students master and demonstrate mastery of that first chunk or that sub-skill before you move on to the next um, 
subskill or part of that mastery learning. So it builds on one another, but it's very important in this process to understand task analysis and to understand the learning progressions in these skills so that you can break them down into these chunks that are manageable for students so they don't become overwhelmed. Again, you'll notice in this, um, this component that we are looking at the system, uh, systematic nature of um, explicit instruction where we're moving from least complex to most complex. Okay, so what does it mean to model and think aloud? Uh, so much of our learning is invisible, it's in our brains. <laughs> so these think alouds offer opportunities for teachers to narrate the processes that they are going through um, when they're navigating a learning goal. Also modeling, um, of course, show, showing, uh, and this is uh, what Charles Hughes and colleagues talked about, they talked about it as showing and telling that we are absolutely uh, modeling these practices um, for students so they um, and direct explicit skills very systematically so they can see uh, what it looks like, but we're also telling, we're verbalizing um, these um, steps along the way. We're doing it as well in very clear, concise, and consistent language. Um, oftentimes with um, teachers, um, we tend to talk a lot. So when we think about explicit instruction, we're using very clear, unambiguous language, very concise language. And if we are modeling these skills and think alouds across grade levels, across content, we're making sure that these, uh, these descriptions and this language are very consistent um, so that students are hearing them um, in the same way. Um, so number three, systematically fading supports and prompts. Um, I know sometimes that's the hardest thing for us to do as teachers. We are very good at building these prompts in and these scaffolded supports, but it's oftentimes difficult for us to remove them. Um, so we want to offer lots of opportunities for practice um, to know when we can fade those responses. The more complex the skill, of course, the more support that is often needed, but we need to be thinking intentionally about how we'll provide the scaffolds, but also how we will fade them away. So um, as you see in the, the uh, next bullet, that the level or strength of the prompts, we gradually reduce those um, supports and scaffolds so that students can uh, demonstrate accuracy and understanding independently, and that's what we're looking for. So we are intentionally thinking about the supports that are needed to meet the learning goal, but we're also um, determining how we will systematically fade those supports um, so that students can demonstrate mastery. Okay, so one of the biggest hallmarks of um, explicit instruction is really this opportunity to respond and receive feedback. Many, 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 many responses. Oftentimes, um, when we think about, um, I know whenever I Google a picture of classroom instruction, every single time the image, if you do this, you probably find the same thing. Um, it's a teacher who is teaching at the front and um, kids are raising their hand. And so when we think about what that means for opportunities to respond and receive feedback, typically that what that means is uh, say perhaps that you have 30 students in your classroom, the teacher has taught a content or concept, they're checking for understanding, and the traditional way is to ask a question and students raise their hand, and then the teacher calls on um, one student. So even though uh, uh, literacy is my passion, certainly I can see that one out of 30 <laughs> is not giving me a, a lot of feedback about what my students have learned, not a lot of formative feedback about what my next instructional move should be. So when we think about this in terms of opportunities to respond, we think about frequency, how often are students responding and um, is it a volunteer basis or are we making it obligatory in the sense that all students have to respond? So when we think about all student responses, we would think about poor responses where all students are responding, um, perhaps on a cue or a signal that allows them to have think time um, so that there's equity in those responses. We would be thinking about whiteboards um, where all students are showing um, in, in regards to a prompt that's related to the learning goal. They might be using response cards with an A, B, C, D, or a yes, no, or a true, false. But the important thing really here on this essential um, component is there's multiple, multiple opportunities for students to respond and then to give them feedback. And remember, we talked about feedback as being either affirmative, where you're confirming um, that students are on the right path, or it could be error correction. And we know always that we want error correction to be immediate, to model the correct response, and then also allow students to engage um, with that um, learning so that they can take away that 
uh, memory trace of that error and replace it with the correct one. So in this component, you're closely monitoring student responses, right? So um, Dr. Archer often says, I walk around, talk around, move around. Uh, it's a very um, active way for the teacher to be engaged um, with um, students. And you'll notice too that the feedback has to be timely and it should be related to the goal. So the feedback would not be, for example, good job. It would provide specific feedback about the student response, whether it was a um, correct response or an error correction or an error that specifically guided them um, to the specifics of what made that response a good response um, or what specifically in the, uh, the response was wrong. Because oftentimes there's something in the response that's correct. We wanna affirm that, but also um, correct the error. So we're making adjustments of instruction in the moment. So it's very, very formative and it's very, very, very engaging uh, between the teacher and the students. All right. Um, and then the last essential component is this purposeful, purposeful practice opportunities. Uh, recently, um, Jack Fletcher and Sharon Vaughn wrote an article. And they said, oftentimes it's, it's not that um, we're not teaching the students. Uh, we are teaching them the concepts, but they're not getting enough practice opportunities. Um, if you're a teacher, oftentimes um, you'll think, um, why didn't students learn this in the grade level before? Why didn't they learn the content? And if you talk to your colleagues, they'll say, well, we taught that, um, but the kids didn't learn that. And oftentimes what's happening there is the concept or the content has been taught, but the students have not had ample opportunities for practice, right? And so in that practice as well, just back to number four or two, um, as a teacher, we're monitoring that practice, that guided practice to determine if they have learned the skill. So practice is extremely important, not only uh, as, it is, as it is close to the learning instruction, right? We wanna make sure that students are practicing what we've just taught them. But um, I hope you're looking at also um, bullet two, which um, it talks about this practice as distributed, cumulative, interleaved work solutions, retrieval testing. So distributed of course means over time that we are not just practicing the skill um, in the moment close to the instructional sequence, of course that's important, but that we also have opportunities to distribute that practice over time. And we also bring it back. We bring back earlier learning that we might've learned perhaps early in the school year. It's cycled back in uh, throughout the course of the year. So it's cumulative, right? So oftentimes kids will learn <laughs> what we've taught them um, perhaps in that um, early instructional sequence, but then, then you don't hold on to it. And so this is where practice is extremely important for distributing it over time, for making sure that the learning that we've um, engaged in previously is brought back up. So it's cumulative. Interleaved means we're giving ourselves time to forget. When we think about retrieval, what, if it's effortful, it's, it's allowing us to bring back that learning. So it's interleaved over time. Uh, work solutions would be giving students opportunities to engage in the process seeing what the um, end goal of that um, learning was and looking at those work solutions and practicing through those so they can see what the correct answer is. And believe it or not, um, testing is a very powerful practice opportunity, quizzes especially as you're moving towards perhaps a final assessment or a unit test to be sure to um, embed quizzes so that students, again, are having to retrieve this information over time um, before it, um, it comes to that all important final assessment. So this retrieval, distributed practice, cumulative and interleaving work solutions. I really want you to keep that in mind when you think about this practice um, and how to make it purposeful. And again, um, during the practice, we're always engaged in providing feedback to the students, whether it's affirmative, uh, that they're moving along in the right learning progression and they're on the track uh, or we're being very specific about what their next step is in that learning progression and affirming where they are now. But of course, if they're making errors, we want to uh, provide immediate. That's so important that the, the research on feedback is um, very, very strong, very, very powerful, but it has to be timely. Uh, it has to happen. Of course, we want it to happen as soon as the error is made when we want that error correction. Um, um, and we want to provide that immediately. And then of course, um, provide opportunities to um, go back to the correct responses so that they can retain those. So in the research study, and this is the most uh, recent one in terms of looking at explicit instruction, looking at the literature from 2000 to two, 2016, 
Um, these five essential components um, were demonstrated in the research um, in over 75% or more of the research. So these five essential components came up over and over and over again, um, and they are the foundation for explicit instruction. So as you think about um, your, instru um, your instruction um, or um, your school district and your uh, support as a leader, these are components that you would want to look for when you're in classrooms or to ensure that are embedded in your, the pedagogy of your um, curriculum. All right, so the seven that you see on the screen here, um, again, this is part of the research by Charles Hughes and his colleagues looking at the literature from 2000 to 2016. These are the components that came up in 50 to 74% of the research study. So you'll see a lot of commonality in here that we're focusing on critical content, the most essential content. Um, uh, sometimes uh, Dr. Archer will say, teach the stuff and cut the fluff. <laughs> So we want to really focus on what is most essential. Not surprising, again, to see that we're sequencing skills logically from least complex to most complex. And uh, again, that task analysis that students have those prerequisites, prerequisite skills, um, as well as the background knowledge to engage successfully in the learning experience. Um, providing students with a clear statement of goal, of course, is sharing that learning intention or that learning goal. So since I'm um, Literacy lead, I thought I would just share one from Empowering Teachers, where they're focusing on, which is from the Florida Center for Reading Research. Um, we're focusing on um, isolation of an initial phoneme. So we might say very clear, clearly to students, we are going to identify the first sound in a word. So we're making it very clear to the students what the learning goal is. Um, so there's no ambiguity. Again, an essential component of explicit instruction. We're also providing lots of examples, but most importantly, two non-examples so that students know um, what um, aligns with the learning goal, but also what does not. The pace is perky. That's what Dr. Archer would say. Uh, she might not say a brisk pace. She would say it's a perky pace. So um, it's not moving too slow. It's not moving too fast, but the pace is brisk. Again, this uh, certainly helps with behavior management and keeps students engaged as well. So it's a perky pace. And we're helping students organize the knowledge that they're learning so that they can um, build on that knowledge as they move along the sequence. Okay, so um, I'd like you to go to the Padlet, if you will. Um, on the Padlet, you'll find a note-taking guide um, that aligns to the video that you're gonna see here in just a moment. So let me see if I can go to that on my screen too so you can see that. Okay. All right. So um, I, I think I could go to this slide. So what I'd like to do is go to the note-taking guide that's on the Padlet. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video by Anita Archer. Um, yes, um, Janine, um, yep, Sarah Fry is putting it in there again. So for anyone who didn't have the Padlet, I'll wait just a moment. Here's where we're, we're gonna be going, okay? And I'm just uh, gonna ask Sarah to make sure that she can see my screen. I sure can. So, yay, <laughs> okay. I'll give folks a moment to just grab that note-taking guide. Uh, the note-taking guide is to facilitate your watching of the, um, Dr. Archer's um, expert minute. This comes from the Middle Tennessee State University. Um, I do really hope um, that you can respond in the chat after we've watched this video. Again, as I said, Dr. Archer pretty much is um, considered the expert in explicit instruction. And this very brief video, around five minutes, she really covers a great deal of information to really inform um, your knowledge and practice about explicit instruction. Um, so uh, some of the questions that are on the note-taking guide or how does she define explicit instruction? Um, one important key point that she's going to review in this video is the difference between explicit instruction and discovery. And that's a key point I would like you to uh, listen for. She is going to offer guidance to special edu educators and interventionists related to instruction. Uh, listen for that. Um, and what are those two areas that she offers guidance for? Um, what concerns does she uh, surface about practice? And we've talked about that a bit. Um, what does she offer about design and delivery of skills? And um, also too, what can you take away from this video as you watch it to think about its application to your practice and your work? 
All right. So I'm hoping by now everyone was able to get to the Padlet. Um, here it is. Um, so here's the video if you want to access it later. Here is the note taking guide. And just for your reference, um, to support your learning, if you'd like to use this in your school as well, as I've created an annotated guide with pretty much the answers, but I'm going to ask you not to look there, <laughs> just to engage in this video um, yourself before you would look to that. So this is where the note taking guide is. Um, certainly don't expect you to print it out or anything, but it's going to, if you have it on your screen, it'll help you as you watch the video. Okay, so here we go. So I have the gift today of talking to you about explicit instruction. Explicit instruction simply is instruction that is quite direct. It is unambiguous with the goal that the students would get it, would understand it, and would learn. We have a lot of confusion around the term explicit instruction, so let me sort of augment and add to that. One question I'm often asked is, wouldn't it be more motivating for students uh, to learn uh, it on their own, to discover it, uh, to use authentic problems to discover it? Uh, and it's as if we have set up a total dichotomy uh, between explicit instruction uh, and discovery, but we really should view it as a continuum. And when we look at the research on instruction, we learn what are the attributes of that continuum. For example, if you are teaching children that are novices, uh, that have just never learned this body of knowledge in the past, it appears that they do much better teach them the information, whether skills or strategies that we teach it. If they are learning a body of knowledge that they've not learned in the past, uh, they're brand new to algebra, uh, they are new to decoding of words, then they really benefit from very explicit instruction. So those two things, when the student is a novice, when the knowledge is new, explicit instruction would be desirable. But then after you've gained lots of information, you've gained lots of skills, then discovery is much more a viable option, but only after you've had explicit instruction. So one of the things that I also would be reminded of is the research, if you happen to be a special ed teacher, an interventionist, uh, and you are working with struggling students, uh, we definitely know that they are going to gain more with very explicit instruction uh, than discovery. You know, if they had discovered it, they would not have been struggling. And so we need to have very explicit instruction for them. And what would that mean? Well, we could actually take explicit instruction and put it into two areas. One is the design of the instruction and the other is the delivery of the instruction. And the design of the instruction means that uh, we pick important content to teach them, uh, we break it down into obtainable pieces, but then our lessons are organized uh, so that more learning could occur. For example, I often talk about three major steps in teaching children skills and strategies, where I do demonstration, guided practice, checking for understanding. I do it, we do it, you do it. And many of the skills and strategies we teach would follow that pedagogy. Um, but it also means that the students are not, direct, not only directly taught it, but they have practice. Actually, I want to tell you, my concern is often that we're not giving adequate practice. Uh, I have constantly hear people say, well, you know, Anita, that is just drill and kill, drill and kill. And I can tell you, uh, we have no reported incidents of children dying of practice. Instead, look at the research, the abundant research from cognitive science and from learning uh, on practice. The students need uh, deliberate practice where they're practicing with a purpose. They need practice that is spaced over time, not all in one session. And they need to retrieve information in that practice. So it's a combination of very uh, explicit instruction with I do it, we do it, you do it, followed with deliberate uh, and space practice uh, and retrieval. But here's what I've noticed. I've had the great blessing of teaching for 52 years and do demonstrations uh, all throughout every year. 
And what I have noticed is that students need better delivery skills than we've done in the past. For example, all instruction needs to be interactive. I say something, you say something, I write something, you write something. All explicit instruction would be very interactive with uh, students actively engaged throughout the entire lesson. And we would give them, we'd monitor and watch their responses, give them feedback on the responses, uh, and we would maintain throughout the whole lesson a very perky pace. So those are some of the attributes uh, of uh, having very explicit instruction. Uh, and we know that then I set you up for your ability to solve authentic problems. I set you up for being successful. I set you up to generalize information to other situations. But this means we've got to keep the teach and teacher. And we have to provide the teaching that our students need. So let us never forget the research on explicit instruction. Because if learning is our goal, then a lot of explicit instruction needs to occur there. Bless you in your career. May you thrive as an educator. Okay. So I'm going to end that there and I'm going to give you, I'm going to put my timer on. I'm just, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to kind of synthesize your thinking on that. Um, maybe the prompts, uh, you can elaborate on the prompts that I suggested. Um, and then I'm going to ask um, you to, to respond in the chat. So I'm going to put the clock on for two minutes. And I uh, would greatly appreciate you participating so we can have <laughs> some engagement so we can model it specific instruction a little bit in a, a webinar. So thank you for considering that. Okay, so you have one more minute. Okay, so that is two minutes, and so um, I would greatly appreciate for I, I don't even I don't get to see you in this uh, format so and I uh, wanted to model as much as we could uh, the engagement of explicit instruction and so. Um, uh, please place in the chat any thoughts uh, from that video, whether it's uh, related to the note taking guide I created or just your own thoughts and then Sarah is going to share those with me. Sure thing, Pam. There are a few things coming in already. Yay. Um, yeah. Thank you. So uh, David, uh, David summed it up very easily, saying purposeful practice. <laughs> and Yay. Then, <laughs> Go, um, David. Thanks for sharing, Barbara, who said, I like that she said that we need to keep the teach and teacher. That's a great mm -hmm. thought. It is. Um, Ken talked about uh, the what we heard from Anita Archer with the continuum between explicit instruction and discovery learning not being mutually exclusive. Um, That's and a very so good did, point. So did right. Marion. And uh, let's see what else. Thanks, Kelly, for chiming in with uh, the differences between design and delivery and the three kinds of practice. Um, and Mary Jo echoed that point. 
And uh, Janine uh, heard something from the end there, uh, Nia Archer's comments about no reported cases of students <laughs> dying from practice. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you participants for sharing your thoughts. Yes, thank you so much for sharing your responses. I really appreciate that. And um, all of what you mentioned resonated with me um, the first time I watched it, and I've watched it a number of times. But just like you, uh, I, I know Janine, and that, um, that one really resonated with, with me too. No one's ever died of uh, drill and kill. Uh, it's not drill and kill, it's drill and skill. And I think that's a message oftentimes that um, we as teachers, I'll speak for myself and my um, you know, <laughs> education, you know, undergrad, graduate, and doctorate it certainly wasn't um, a message that was really shared with me about pedagogy. And I'm, I'm guessing perhaps um, the five essential um, attributes of explicit instruction, the seven components that we briefly looked at, were likely not ones that you have um, been taught as, as well. And so um, really important for us to understand these in a deep way, but also then think about what they look like in practice, right? So research is always important and should inform our instruction, especially when it's inform, informing us around the time that we spend with students uh, with instruction and intervening. Um, we want to make sure that what we're engaged in is the most effective. And as, as Dr. Archer said, we have um, uh, quite a bit of research to support that explicit instruction. Uh, we stand on firm ground when we're engaged in explicit instruction, especially when students are in that, as she pointed out, which I really, appreciate it as well. When they're novice learners, when they're learning something new, or when they're a struggling learner, it's essential for us to be engaged in explicit instruction. So we've looked at the components from our research view. We've heard from the expert, um, Dr. Anita Archer, um, but what does that look like in a classroom? Um, I think that's the big question oftentimes as a trainer um, at Patton. Um, we always want to know, okay, so thank you for sharing the research. I'm, I'm uh, pleased that it's so supported in the field. Um, so what does that look like though in the classroom? And so again, we're going to um, turn to Dr. Archer to look at that um, in just a moment here. But as you said, these are the key points that you kind of brought up. Um, when students have uh, little or no knowledge, you want to be engaged in explicit instruction or if they are at risk um, with, and they have difficulty or they have had failure in an area. But we don't move to discovery learning until we know a lot about what we're going to be discovering. I mean, uh, she didn't say, I think she did say in this video, I, I believe, um, if they would have um, discovered it, right? They would have already discovered it if they, you know, if they hadn't learned it, right? They, they're not discovering what we haven't taught them, especially for many kids. So before we move to discovery instruction, we want to make sure that they have a lot of background, a lot of practice, and they're ready to be released and they have lots of success in that area. So um, we're going to watch a video of what this looks like in a classroom. And um, uh, Dr. Archer has a website aligned with her book, Explicit Instruction uh, with Charles Hughes, but she has many, many, many videos of what explicit instruction looks like in um, different grade levels. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch uh, a second grade video of her teaching an explicit instruction um, model for vocabulary instruction. So I want you to be thinking about design, um, how the lesson was designed, but also how it was delivered. The students are going to be learning three vocabulary words. Also, um, I do have a note taking guide for this, but not including the guide that I do sometimes, is I tally how many times the students have the word in their mouth. Oftentimes the one um, who is doing most of the speaking um, is the teacher, or, and the teacher has the um, vocabulary words in their mouth, but not so much the students. So what I want you to notice um, in this video is, if you don't mind, as you're looking at the note-taking guide to count how many times, tally how many times students have the word in their mouth. It's so important for kids to have the phonological word form in their mouth. Um, it, it supports their um, meaning of the word as well. It's very essential. So I do have a note-taking guide for this. I'll, let me show you where it is on the padlet real quick. Um, and again, there we go. So move that out of the way. Here's the video too, if you ever want to watch that specific video. And here's the note-taking guide. You'll notice at the top of this note-taking guide, there's an explicit routine that she kind of follows. And we're kind of debrief on that routine um, after we're done watching the video. But um, there is the note-taking guide and there's a video if you want to watch it later, okay? Uh, this one's a little bit longer. It's, just short of eight minutes, but I strongly encourage you to really be paying close attention to the design and the delivery of this lesson, 
Um, the uh, questions in the note-taking guide can certainly guide your feedback after, just as you've done before the, uh, for the other one. And thank you so much for that. Um, but please feel free to um, um, report back on anything that you find interesting. All right, so here we go. We're gonna cross our fingers at technology our friend again. Okay. Now, there are some words in this story that I would really like us to learn because we could use them all of the time. And this word is, let's read it by parts. The first part is con. What part, everyone? Con, and use the sound s. And the next part is sen. And the last part is trait. And say it really fast, everyone. Concentrate. One more time, everyone. Concentrate. One more time. Concentrate. Now, you remember in the story that some of the animals couldn't, what, everyone? concentrate uh, when the wolf was reading. Now the word concentrate means that you are able to really think about something. You're able to put all of your attention on it. So when I really think about something and put all of my attention on it, I, what everyone, I concentrate. What do I do everyone? I concentrate. For example, if you were doing your math and you did one problem and then the next problem, the next problem, and never looked up when someone came in the room, we would say that she knows how to what, everyone? Concentrate. concentrate. If you came to the library and sat down and you took out a book and you just read and read, even though he came over and she walked around you, we'd say, ah, boy, you are able to put your thinking on it, you're able to put your attention on it. She knows how to what, everyone? Concentrate. Get ready to tell me if this person in the pretend story knows how to concentrate. So you are reading in class and you just read and you turn the page and you read some more and you read some more and you read some more and you just keep reading. Does she know how to concentrate? Yes or no, everyone? Yes. yes. Okay. And this is pretend because it would never happen. So you start reading a page and then you look up at the clock and then you look down and then you talk over with your friends and you look back at the book. Does she know how to concentrate, yes or no? no? She really does. That was just a pretend story. So once again, what is our word, everyone? Concentrate. Well, let's look at our next word. And the first part, everyone, is M. Next one is press. And the whole word is impressed. So you are impressed with something when you think something is really good or someone is really good. Now you remember in the story, at the beginning, they were not impressed uh, with Wolf's reading. When I think something is really good, or I think someone is really good, I am what, everyone? Impressed. impressed. I'm what, everyone? Impressed. impressed. So for example, if you turned in a story, and it had a title, and a main character, and a problem, and told me what happened in the beginning, middle, and end, <gasps> I'd say, oh, that is so good. I am what, everyone? Impressed. impressed. Uh, if you did all of your math problems, and you had numbers that were really neat, and I could read them all, I would say, oh, thank you. I am so impressed. All right. Now, let's just pretend here that we go off to your house, and we go in your bedroom, and each of us come out and we say, oh, I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed. Now pretend that we are really impressed. Put your thumb up, and as soon as you can think of why we might be impressed. Oh, I got an idea. Okay, so you're going to tell your partner why you're impressed, but you're gonna start out by saying, I was impressed because. What are you gonna say, everyone? I was impressed because. So first ones and twos, tell your partner, if we went to her bedroom and we said we were impressed, why would be, we be impressed? Go. I was impressed. I was really impressed because I'm Excellent. And your idea? That would be really... Maybe she had oh, lots of toys. Uh -huh. So say, I was impressed because she had lots of toys. Can you say that? His turn. Go ahead. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, looking up here. So, using I was impressed. So, tell me your sentence. I was impressed because the room was clean. And your sentence? 
I was impressed because she had a lot of toys and right here. I started out, I was impressed. Okay, now we're talking about a room. I'm impressed that you know how to do math. That's excellent. But make it match the room. So we went to a room. Maybe she had lots of dolls. And you said, I am impressed because she had many dolls. Can you say that? Excellent job. Well, once again, this word is what, everyone? Impressed. impressed. I am very impressed with you. Last word is educated. What word, everyone? Educated. When we learn something, particularly how to read and write, we say that then we are what, everyone? Educated. So when we come to school here and we work on learning how to read and write, we become more what, everyone? Educated. But then when we go to third and fourth and fifth grade and we learn more and more and we get more and more knowledge, we become more what, everyone? Educated. And when you go to middle school, you're going to become more educated. And when you go to high school, you're going to become more educated. When you go to college, you're going to become more educated. Excellent. Now, I'm going to tell you about one of these words. As soon as you know the word, put your thumb up. I'm thinking about a word that means that you've learned to read and write and maybe other kinds of knowledge. Put your thumb up when you know that word. And whisper to your partner the word I'm thinking about. Okay, so when you've learned to read and write, then we would say you are educated. I'm thinking of a word that means I think that something is really good. Put your thumb up when you know the word. Whisper to your partner. And the word is what, everyone? Impressed. I am thinking about a word that means you really know how to put all of your thinking and attention on something. Whisper to your partner. Excellent. And the word is what, everyone? Yes. Now, these are words that you could use. For example, maybe you are sitting in the library with a friend and you want to read and they're being very noisy. You could say, oh, please be quiet. I need to concentrate. Or maybe uh, your friend writes a beautiful story and it's really a good story and you say, oh, I am impressed. Or you could go home at night and say, oh, I'm learning so much in school. I am definitely becoming educated. Excellent job, everybody standing up. And I am so impressed with you. During the whole lesson, you were able to, what, everyone? concentrate. Yes, you really paid attention and were thinking about what we were doing. And uh, because you learned these new words, you are even more, what everyone? Educated. educated. So I want you to see if you can find a time today where you could use those words. For example, when your teacher finishes a lesson, you could go up afterward and say, oh, that was so good. I am impressed. impressed. Okay, so see if you can use some of these words today and lining up there. And thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Um, let's give you a couple of minutes again to um, think about what you just saw, maybe take some final notes. And then again, I greatly appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much for doing that earlier as well. So I'm putting the timer on for two. I have about uh, 30 seconds left.
Okay. So um, again, would greatly appreciate um, a response to this um, model of explicit instruction lesson. Um, to any of the prompts or anything that you want to share out about what you just saw, um, certainly. Sure, Pam. Sure, we've got a few responses. Oh, good. Um, as I'm uh, as I'm sharing those, if you want to flip back over to your slides to pick up, that would be cool. Um, um, okay, I did, um, but I'll let me try again so we make sure that you are seeing that. And are you now seeing? Yes. Awesome. Gotcha. So um, we, uh, we we heard some, from some participants who have commented about the pace being brisk and quick. Um, mm -hmm. Also about just the amount of practice. So much, so many great opportunities for practice. Did anyone common? keep a tally? Did anyone keep a tally of how many times? I'm just curious if anyone did. Uh, eight to ten. Is uh, another uh, attendee said over ten. Yep, <laughs> for sure. Um, lots of times the kids had that word in their mouth. So yes, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, what else are you seeing, Sarah? Um, the just uh, let's see. David uh, commented that it was a great use of the think pair share strategy. Mm -hmm. And then yep. um, Janine shared that she loved that she included the error correction. Also, sentence stems, distributed practice, scaffolded one-on-one -on -one support for those that were struggling. Um, mm -hmm. But while uh, supporting that st a struggling student, allowing that student to be a part of the whole group response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also cumulative practice. It was distributed, but at the end, she really went through all three of the uh, the words, right? And I love the the think pair share, as you said, the ones and twos. Um, did you notice too the examples and non-examples that she provided? Um, just uh, pretty much a mastery <laughs> a lesson uh, of everything that we've been talking about in this um, presentation about explicit instruction. Certainly seeing the essential components and those seven um, attributes of explicit instruction. So, um, and and I know um, you know this is the kind of instruction that we're hoping to see in classrooms when students are novice learners that they have this. Um, very direct explicit instruction opportunities for practice and examples and non-examples. Um, so did it, feel, did it feel like drill and kill there or did it feel like drill and skill? What do you think? I'm seeing no on the drill and kill. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, because sometimes, um, you know, we want to make sure that we kind of like uh, dispel those myths about explicit instruction, right? It's very actively engaging. Do you think that the kids, um, will go home and share those words or they will own those words. What do you think about that? Do you think they'll own those words? And their meanings too, of course. What do you think about that? That kind of lesson will it help them um, own those words that they will um, know their um, phonological form, how to pronounce them and also what they mean. What do you think about that? Barbara, uh, Barbara shared that she thought that it was skill with repetitive practice and that they will indeed own those words. Yeah, and that's what we want, right? Um, so um, explicit instruction is going to get us there. So, okay. So um, I want you to just look on the screen and at the top of your note taking guide was um, a routine for teaching vocabulary. It's very similar to um, what Dr. Archer um, shared. Of course, she was doing um, sharing uh, three words, uh, the meanings of three words and how they are pronounced. But um, in your um, instruction and or your work as a coach or a principal, um, this, these routine cards, which are on the palette, there are um, five different examples of instructional routines for vocabulary. And just on the screen, you're seeing the one uh, for teaching an unknown vocabulary word, similar to what Dr. Archer said. So for example, um, as you saw, she had written the words um, on the chart, but we'd write the word on the board. And for example, the word reluctant, we would directly say, this word is reluctant. What word? And of course, you would want student responses, part of explicit instruction, that they would say reluctant, right? And then a student-friendly definition was provided um, as part of the instructional sequence uh, that Dr. Archer did as well. Reluctant means you are not sure you want to do something. When you're not sure you want to do something, you are. And again, student response, uh, reluctant. Then you illustrate with examples. Um, I would also say, like not examples, uh, if your mother asks you to try new food, you might be reluctant. Uh, and this is uh, the italicizes where the students are saying the words, you may be 
reluctant to watch a scary movie. Uh, and then as you can see, we're checking for understanding. Why would a student be reluctant to go to a new school? Why would you be reluctant to go to recess on a warm Sunday? Or would you be an not example there? Um, and then tell your partner that opportunity to um, have that discourse, that academic discourse in the classroom using the target word that the teacher is trying to teach. And then of course, at the end, start your sentence by saying a cat might be reluctant to, and then tell why. So those language stems too are very important for students who may not have the oral language yet to participate fully. And you saw that in the video as well. There was a student um, who didn't use the language stem uh, prompt that Dr. Archer had provided, but she scaffolded them and supported them, but also held them um, um, accountable and a warm, I, I sometimes say she's a warm demander in the sense that she um, made sure that the students was using the language stem and using the um, target word in the correct um, manner for meaning to. So those um, routine cards are on the Pavit for you as just an example of what explicit, an explicit instructional routine would look like. Um, I'll go to that in just a moment, but there's another um, uh, place where you can um, look at, of course, uh, the, the examples here are literacy examples. Um, however, um, certainly there are other examples in terms of instructional routines for explicit instruction. Um, this is one I started uh, with. This is from the Florida Center for Reading Research. They have a whole series of instructional routines based on the big five of reading, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. But regardless of whether this uh, lines directly with what your work um, scope is, um, I want you to, to look at the um, overarching headers and see how this aligns with explicit instruction. So for example, um, first thing is, as I said before, um, I'm going to make a clear, concise uh, language uh, objective for students what the goal is. So we are going to identify the first sound in a word, then I model the task, listen, sun, sun, is the first sound in the word sun, right? So I provided a model and I've been very explicit about the goal. Um, then uh, the, I asked the students to practice with me, say sun with me, and hopefully you would say sun. <laughs> say the first sound in sun, respond. The students respond, yes, is the first sound in sun. Your turn, say sun. And you will repeat sun. Say the first sound in sun, yes, is the first sound in sun. So um, you can see on the palette as well as, you know, a little bit on this slide that we have these uh, components and attributes of explicit instruction with, embedded within this instructional routine, um, a clear explanation, a clear model, opportunities for students to practice with the teacher, and then um, opportunities for students to uh, go to the your turn, back to the uh, demonstration guided practice, and then, um, the release of responsibility for students to practice um, independently. So an I do, we do, and then you do the uh, students. And, uh, the nice thing about these um, particular instructional um, routines is it has um, opportunities for adaption at the bottom um, and for error correction. So scaffolding suggestions for errors. So this is a very um, powerful instructional routines that embed the components of explicit instruction. So I wanted to share those with you. All right, um, let me go to the palette real quick with that and then we'll just close up so I can just show you what's on there. I'm sorry, I just have to move a couple things around to do that. So are you seeing the palette, Sarah? I just wanna make sure. I am, if you wouldn't mind just dragging your Zoom bar a little away, it's-, uh, it's oh, Sorry about that. Okay, so there you go. Um, before we close up, I just wanted to share with you what's on the palette. Um, to continue your learning um, after this presentation. There's a PDF of the presentation itself. There's a video of Dr. Archer from the Middle Tennessee State University's Expert Minute talking about explicit instruction. There's this note-taking guide that's open, but also an annotated one that I've created for you. There's a direct link to the video that we saw. Um, and there is the instruction routine card with a note-taking guide aligned to that video. Um, there are, um, as I said, five different uh, routines or teaching words in these routine cards from the National uh, Reading Technical Assistance Network. And then finally, um, there are these routines from the Empowering Teacher. So I, I wanna take you just there so you can see how to get to them. As you can see, um, here are the instructional routines and then it's broken down by um, you know, all these different skills. 
Um, let me go back so you can see there's phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocab and comprehension, but it goes K to third grade. And so you just click on a routine and say that I wanted to focus on phoneme blending in first grade. And there you go, there's that routine for you and it follows that very direct explicit instruction um, components, all right? So I just wanted to share those with you. So sometimes you get things and then you don't really know how to access them. So I wanna make sure that you have that. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. Um, and then I'll ask Sarah again, are you seeing what <laughs> we should be seeing? Absolutely, yes. Yay, wonderful. So um, in closing, if, if you don't mind again, I will reflect on these questions and think about um, how your school or uh, wherever your um, work environment is, how you engage in this ass assess, analyze, interpret, instruct, reflect, and monitor process um, from P the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, how has this presentation hopefully uh, made you think about your instructional planning and these five essential components and seven uh, uh, components as well, work specific instruction. And how might you infuse the I do, whatever your role is, how might you infuse I do, we do, you do into your daily instruction? So those are prompts to kind of close us up, but um, anything that you would like to share that um, hopefully you've gained from this presentation or how you might use the resources that were shared to um, further um, your work would be greatly appreciated. And then we'll close up. And then Sarah, you can just tell me if anyone responds, that would be awesome. Mary Jo shared that uh, that at her school they've been using I do we do you do for years Yay. And, and, uh, and and believes that it really works and now that the kids mimic this pattern when they ask uh, when they're asked to to teach each other and <laughs> offer peer support that's wonderful Thank, congratulations to you and your school district and for your students too Anything else to share? Uh, Ken uh, put out there that, and I, it's, it's great advice to just share with everybody who might be watching uh, asynchronously, that teachers can use these strategies with remote learners too. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you, Ken, appreciate that. Yep, good teaching is good teaching whether you're face-to-face -face or virtual. Okay, so if there's nothing else, I'll just move forward or should I move forward or not? I'm, I'm not seeing anything quite okay. yet. Go for it. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, so um, there are resources that are embedded um, in this presentation beyond that Padlet. So um, these are hyperlinks there. I, I did place them in the Padlet. So do you know um, if these um, PowerPoints will be shared in some way that they can access them to access these links? Do you know that? Yes. Okay. Yes, um, we are uh, presenters uh, are have been not all, but many of them have been sharing the uh, PDF or a PowerPoint file of their presentation. Those will be uploaded to the PDE accelerated learning website where okay. you can find those uh, additional documents and resources, plus a recording of this video will be shared to the accelerated learning website and the PDE YouTube playlist. Wonderful. So I will share um, not only uh, the PDF, of course, it's on the Padlet, but I will share the actual PowerPoint to you so that folks can use it, but they can also um, access these hyperlinks that are embedded in the PowerPoint. So some really wonderful resources there. There's um, also, let's see, was it in there? Uh, I think it's coming up in the next slides. Um, these are, again, resources for you to check out right here. I was watching this video earlier this morning. Um, it's uh, one that was done by Patton on explicit instruction. It's absolutely amazing. Our director at uh, Patton Harrisburg, Angela Kirby, um, is um, part of that, as well as uh, Dr. Laura, well, it's actually Dr. Kirby now, and Dr. Laura, Laura Moran are um, some of the presenters in this explicit instruction video. It's great. Lots of classroom um, videos uh, embedded in that learning. So check that out. Okay, so um, we did end a little bit earlier, I thought we would, and so uh, that gives you a little bit more time in your afternoon um, to submit for your attendance. Um, there's a link for a Google form, or as you can see, there's a QR code on the slide, um, and there's an exit code for this session. Sarah, I didn't know if you had to add any um, facilitator information to this slide or not. 
No, we will drop a, uh, if folks are having issues with accessing those, uh, accessing the attendance link, I'm dropping the, uh, the link right in the chat window right now. Um, and just as a friendly reminder, uh, the QR code and the link that's in the chat window as, as well on the screen, are, they all go to the same place. We just wanted to make sure everybody, uh, we were following UDL and giving you multiple means. So lots of points of access for the attendance form, but that's all. Okay. And I want to thank you so much for attending today. And for those who will watch uh, the recording, thank you for watching the recording and participating in this important work. And uh, a big thanks as well to those who responded in the chat and um, really um, supported this um, presentation to be interactive and engaging as uh, part of explicit instruction components. Greatly appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you at another patent training, hopefully <laughs> someday soon.